Good morning, Grace. How are you? Great job, Wes. Whew, guys, we did it. Three services. You don't care. All right, cool. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Don't clap for me. Just clap for everyone else. It's cool. Uh, just jokes. Hey, my name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad you guys are here today. Uh, we're excited about this new season in our church, so thank you for changing your schedule, volunteering, giving, all the things you've done to make this possible. We are grateful. Uh, if you have your Bible, would you turn it to Hebrews chapter 11? We'll be there in just a minute. It's connected to Acts chapter 17, I promise. Uh, we're back in the book of Acts. It's been a while, but we're in Acts 17, picking up on Paul's second missionary journey. If you haven't been following along so far, what we have is Christ has resurrected from the dead. He's empowered the disciples to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, and they are traveling and making it happen. And we are on the second journey of Paul uh, traveling around and sharing. And most times when Paul shares the gospel somewhere, like it doesn't go that well. He gets beat up. He's thrown in jail. There's a riot in the city. So much so like they, they travel with a doctor. Like he's like, I get hit so often. I need a doctor to like be around me all the time. That's what Luke is. And then they get to this place called Berea. And Paul starts preaching the gospel. And instead of throwing stuff at him, which is usual, uh, everyone like pulls out their journal and their, by their scrolls, and they start getting ready to take notes. And Paul's like, wait a second, this is different. Uh, this is not usual. So if you grew up as a Christian in the 90s or the early 2000s, you may have heard of the Berean Christian Bookstore. Anybody? The Berean Christian? Yeah, Bakersfield has one. Anybody? Yeah, Bakersfield has everything. Uh, this group of Christians is so awesome, they're like, we should name bookstores after these people, okay? <laughs> like, they, they are that kind of people. And so growing up, you would see, like, church swag that says, be a Berean. And you're like, what does that even mean? Uh, that's from Acts chapter 17. So they have a couple of things about them that Luke calls them noble. They receive the message with great eagerness. They examine the scriptures every day, and they believed in faith. And they provide for us a vision of how we should approach the Bible and how we should posture ourselves towards the Bible, eager to receive it, examining it every day for truth, and then obeying it in faith. So that's how we should handle the Bible. But I know in a room this size, we have all different backgrounds coming to the Bible. So I want to take this opportunity to preach a sermon about examining the Bible. Uh, my first exposure to the Bible was my mom had a large King James, like, living room edition version on the side table at our house, and it was huge, and it always collected dust, and one of my chores was dust the Bible, Josh, and so uh, that, that was growing up, and then when I got my own Bible, candidly, I treated it like a genie in the bottle, where I would just open it, close my eyes, and point to something, and be like, God, would you speak to me today, and you open, and you're like, and Judas hung himself, oh God, that's not good, like, <laughs> what's happening, um, so my experience with the Bible was like, open it, point, see what happens, uh, I do not recommend that approach, but I get it. Then my senior year of high school, our church gave graduating seniors an NIV study Bible. And so I got to like see some of the history in the background. Then I go to college and I, I major in the Bible and I learn so much. And so I, I don't know where you are in your journey with the Bible, but today we want to talk about it. So some fun facts about the Bible. In 1995, the Guinness Book of World Records acknowledge that the Bible was the all-time best-selling book in history with 5 billion copies sold. Now, for scale, that's 100 million a year, which is crazy. Uh, the Quran has sold 800 million, and Harry Potter, the whole series, which is just under the Bible in terms of beauty and scope, right, is, uh, has sold 500 million. So 500 million for Harry Potter, and the Bible's like, I did that five years ago. Like, I just do that every five years. Uh, but that is a Guinness Book of World Records. Here's some, some poll study about the Bible, some recent polls. 88% of Americans own a Bible. 72, 75% of Christians say they believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't understand that statistic at all. I don't think that's a thing, but apparently it's a thing. It's out there. Like, oh, I follow Jesus, but the Bible is not the Word of God. Okay, interesting. 42% uh, say reading the Bible is essential to being a Christian. 35% say they read the Bible weekly. 26% of Americans believe the Bible is secular stories and history. So the middle ground is disappearing. There are people that believe the word is authoritative, and there are others who don't, but the middle ground is changing. Uh, do some Q&A with me here, some, some fun call and response. How many languages was the Bible written in? 
Three, two, one, three. Three is the answer. Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Hebrew, Old Testament, Greek, and Aramaic in the New Testament. Uh, what is the longest book in the Bible? Psalms, trick question. That is not, that has the most chapters, but the most words is Jeremiah, actually. Fun fact. I know you're going to Google it. You're like, is that true? <laughs> Just reporting the news up here, you guys. Jeremiah, followed by Genesis, followed by Psalms, then Ezekiel. Shortest book in the Bible. Great. Third John, good job. Some good answers. How many literary genres are in the Bible? Yeah, nobody knows. I'm not even going to listen. Like, uh, <laughs> like five, six, seven, eight, nine. Like there's lots of different thoughts on this. Here's what I came up with. The law, history, wisdom, poetry, narrative, letters, prophecy, apocalyptic. These are the genres, and each genre should be uh, you know, interpret it accordingly. But this is where we start, that the Bible is both a human book and a divine book, and we are okay with that. These words were written by humans as God spoke to them, inspiring them to, to write the Bible. It's also a storytelling document and a covenantal document. So it's telling us the story of redemptive history towards a people that God is in covenant with. That's what's happening here. And when we talk about the Bible being authoritative, what we mean is the Bible is how Jesus expresses his authority over us. The Bible is how Jesus expresses and exercises his authority over us. And so when we read the Bible, we hear the word of God. The joke is, uh, I I don't hear God's voice. And they just say, read the Bible out loud. That's it. That's how you hear God's voice. Just read it out loud. So, haha, not that funny. Okay. When I went to college, we learned what was called the revelatory triangle. If you picture a triangle, at the top of it is the word revelation. It means that God has acted in human history, creation, exodus, incarnation. On the left was the word inspiration, meaning God had certain humans write down what he had done. And then on the right was the word illumination, which means the Holy Spirit helps us understand what was written about what God has done. And so we have to understand that illumination, basically interpretation, is always lower than inspiration. God's inspired word is from his mind through the Holy Spirit to Paul. And so people are always like, well, I disagree with Paul on that one. And I like to whisper, then it means you disagree with God. Awkward silence. Okay, yeah. You can't disagree with Paul because that's disagreeing with God. All right? I I don't have time. Uh, This short, with these three services really messing up my sermon space. Here, I got to go faster. All right. So what that means is you can't grab a verse of the Bible and make it mean for you something it didn't mean for them. The classic is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you ever see that in a, like a powerlifting shirt, it's not about weightlifting. That's not what that verse is about. Uh, it's called proof texting. If you ever had someone say, I'm going to go ask out that girl, and you're like, bro, you shouldn't ask out that girl. She's out of your league. You would be doing her damage to ask her out. And he's like, no, bro, Philippians 4.13. And we're like... Okay, sir, go find out the hard way uh, why that verse doesn't mean that. So that happens all of the time, and we can't do that. We have to know what it meant in their day and apply it to our day in submission to the original author's intent to the original audience. Okay, in Acts chapter 17, the Bereans modeled for us something we have got to get our heads around, and it's called a reasoned faith. The Bereans had a reasoned faith, a faith built on substance. They they received the word with great eagerness. We want to hear the word of God. We we long for the word of God. We're ready to hear it. They examined what they heard every single day, seeking the truth, and then they obeyed it in faith. They had a reasoned faith. And so how do we do that? How do we have faith? What is faith? And how do we put our faith in the word? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11 We can read about this and apply it to Acts 17. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So faith in the word is this internal state of saying, I really think this is true and I'm basing it on some substance. So it's not, it's not just believing it mentally, it's acting on it in the real world. So another way to say it, here's the principle. Biblical faith begins with reason. 
but it's completed by action and obedience. Faith is having confidence that that's true, but it's not a blind confidence. It's a substantive confidence. It's a hope built on something, not on nothing. It's, it's believing a future reality because of current understanding of substance. So illustration, I used to live in Washington State on the east side of Washington. Around Halloween, it would get freezing cold. To this day, I don't know what my kids were for Halloween because we were all wearing jackets and blankets on Halloween. So there was a dress under there of some Disney princess, but I never saw it, right? Because we were all freezing. It would get freezing cold in Halloween. And then in April, it would still be freezing cold until like right now it's freezing in Washington. And midway through April, you would start to think, I should move to San Diego. This is the Lord preparing me to move. Every April, you're like, it will never be warm again. And you're wearing multiple coats, and you're over it, and you're shoveling snow, and it's just every day, all day. Now, the first snow is magical, but it's terrible in April. And then you walk outside one day, and you see something that that speaks to a future hope. It happened every single year. You would see this, a tulip coming through the snow. And you would walk outside sad, wearing all your clothes, looking like the kid from A Christmas Story, you know, like (laughs) Ralphie's little brother. You're walking out, and then you just are stopped in your tracks, and you see the tulip. And then you just stand there and you just reason with the tulip. What are you doing here, tulip? Ah, you represent something, tulip. You mean it it won't always be cold. And then all of a sudden, like, one tear comes out of your eye. (laughs) You're like, it will not always be cold. And then just subconsciously, you start unzipping your outer jacket. You have multiple jackets on. But you unzip your outer jacket. And without taking your eyes off the tulip, you just... Throw your outer jacket in the house and you just keep focused in faith on that. Because what you see there is the beginning of a future reality. The substance of a future reality. And when you act in faith, you are getting in touch with that future reality. Because a couple days later you walk out and you see this. There'd be fields of tulips in the snow. So church, listen to me. Christian faith is not blind faith. It's tulip in the snow faith. That there is substance proving to me a future reality. We see this further on in Hebrews chapter 11. And by faith, even Sarah, so it's commending someone in faith, who, who was well past childbearing age, she was enabled to bear children because she, what did she do? She considered him faithful who had made the promise. She thought to herself, I'm too old to have children. The next verse says, and so from one man who was as old as dead, That's a great Bible verse right there. How old was he? He was dead. That's how old he was. I don't even know. We stopped counting. That's Hebrews 11, verse 12. You need a memory verse? He was as old as death. From him came all the descendants that are as numerous as the the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. So Sarah was told she was going to have a baby, but she has a problem. She's old and her husband's old. So she reasons. Who is the one that made the promise? The one who's faithful. The God who's been trustworthy. The God who delivers on his promises. Yes, this doesn't make sense to me, but the future reality is built on substance, not blind faith. So the Bible does not teach you to reject reason. It teaches you to examine things for substance. Look for substance. You do not have to divorce the two. There is a a misunderstanding in the world that faith and reason are separate. You see this in, in atheism today. There's a famous atheist named Sam Harris. He defines faith as... The license religious people give themselves to keep believing when reasons fail. The license religious people give themselves to keep believing when reasons fail. Richard Dawkins famously said, Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps of, the lack of evidence. So the idea out there is that if you're a person of faith, then you cannot be a person of reason. This happens every year in freshman, uh, in freshman philosophy class at university. They show up and some professor tells them why they shouldn't be a Christian because that's small town thinking and the small town youth group thought and all of a sudden they're here and they need to open their minds and faith and reason are at odds with each other. That is no way the biblical vision of faith. The biblical vision of faith is substantive. It's reasoned and you're putting confidence in something that is worthy of then putting your faith in. So I want to give you a few things on why we should be like the Bereans and put our faith in the Bible. 
Why is the Bible trustworthy and able to withstand our reasoning? Number one, predicted prophecy. God is in control of history. 27% of the Bible is prophetic. It's telling you what's going to happen in the future. Over 1,800 verses are pre-written history about what was going to happen in the future. And they're, they're evidence of God's foreknowledge. God knows the future. So he predicts the future, and then in his sovereignty, he orchestrates events in human history, fulfilling his prophecy, proving his foreknowledge. That's how God works. And so the fall of Babylon, the length of Judah's captivity, the destruction of cities, all being told. But the prophecies crescendo in the great pinnacle of the meta narrative of Scripture, which is the coming of the Son of God, the Messiah, the great Savior into the world. And here's here's some of the prophecies he fulfilled. And there's a lot. So I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to read really fast. You ready? These are some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. He would be born of a virgin called Emmanuel, born in Bethlehem. Great persons would come to adore him. They would kill children in Bethlehem. Therefore, he would be called out of Egypt. He'd be preceded by a forerunner. He'd be anointed by the Holy Spirit. He'd be a prophet like Moses, a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He would enter public ministry in Galilee, show up in Jerusalem riding a donkey. He would live in poverty and meekness, tenderness, and compassion. He would be without deceit. He'd be full of zeal, preaching in parables, working miracles, bearing reproach. He would be rejected by his own Jewish brothers. Jews and Gentiles would come together against him. He would be betrayed by a friend. Even his disciples would forsake him. He'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He would die with intense suffering, yet be silent under that suffering. He'd be struck on his cheek. He'd be spit on. His hands and his feet would be nailed to a cross. He'd be forsaken by God. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would be mocked. Gall and vinegar would be offered to him. His garments would be parted. Lots would be cast for his clothing. He'd be numbered among the transgressors. He would intercede for his murderers. He would die, but a bone of his body wouldn't break. He'd be buried with the rich. His flesh would not see corruption. He'd be raised from the dead. He would ascend back to the right hand of God the Father. All of this recorded hundreds of years before Jesus even entered the world. And many of these prophecies are fulfilled not by his friends, but by his enemies. Those who stand to lose the most with their fulfillment, yet they are fulfilled before Jesus was born, while he's in his mother's womb, and while he was in the grave. Church, someone is in control of history. There is a tulip in the snow, and there is substance by which we can build our hope on. The book in your hands has no rival. There's nothing like the Bible in its predicted prophecy. Number two, archaeological confirmation. The historicity of the Bible continues to be verified. I know this is educational and heady. I'm going to tell you a story at the end. Hopefully, that'll make you get all the feels, okay? But stay with me educationally. You ready? The story of the Bible is not the telephone game. You ever played the telephone game, youth group, where you start a sentence over here and then over here, you're like, how in the world did this sentence turn into that? Well, it's because one junior high kid messed it up. That's what happened in the story. (laughs) Like some kid that had no interest playing the game messed it up, right? You kind of think that about the Bible. Who's that one scribe that was like messing with everybody, right? Like the telephone game. That's that's not the design. Right now, there are 5,800 Greek copies of the New Testament. Over 10,000 Latin manuscripts of the Bible. 9,300 manuscripts in other languages. And they've been recorded and they've they've been uh, cross-referenced against the uh, coming from the original manuscripts. And all of this had a moment in history in 1947 that changed the world. On the western coast of the Dead Sea in a place called Qumran, a couple of shepherds lost their sheep in a cave that looks like this. And to get their sheep out, they start throwing rocks in the cave because that's what you do. You just throw your rocks and make the sheep come out. And they threw a rock and they heard a jar break. And so they go in and the jars look like this. And over the next nine years, archaeologists find what would become known as the Dead Sea Scrolls which are considered by many to be the single most important archaeological manuscripts found in the 20th century. 1,400 original documents. 10, or sorry, 100,000 fragments in all. Some of them are 30 feet long. They found the whole scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when they started to study these and got, uh, you know, professors of antiquity involved, they dated these back to, to 65 AD and some as early as 250 B.C., Previous to that, the earliest manuscripts were 1,000 A.D. So now what you have, stay with me, is 1,000 years earlier 
thousands of manuscripts to compare to 1,000 years later. So the telephone game is now on the hot seat. Do these documents look like these documents that are 1,000 years earlier than these documents? And so they get together, they compare all these things, and the documents that are 1,000 years older than these documents are within 99% the same. 1,000 years apart, 99% accuracy. The, pro- the professor that found, was able to study these, his name was Eleazar Sukhanek, and he, he says, my hands shook as I started to unwrap one of them. I read a few sentences, and it was beautiful biblical Hebrew. The language was that of the Psalms, but the text was unknown to me. I looked, and I looked, and suddenly I had the feeling that I was privileged by destiny to gaze upon a Hebrew scroll which had not been read for more than 2,000 years. The Holy Spirit preserved the word of God for the people of God as they are now going on the mission of God. And I know, church, it takes faith to believe that. In college, my hermeneutics professor would say it takes faith to believe the Bible. But that faith is substantive. His homepage of his computer wasn't google.com. It was an archaeological website. And he said, every day I hope they find stuff. Because I know that what they'll find will continue to show the substantive nature of this book I put my faith in. It is not divorced from reason. Number three, unanimity. 2,000 years, three languages, complex history, everyone has the same story. Another evidence of Scripture is the unity of the Bible. Contrast the Bible with any other religious books. There are other holy books in the world. Uh, The Muslims believe that Allah sent the angel Gabriel to Muhammad to reveal the Quran. Yet, in 114 chapters of the Quran, none of them have a single theme that would tie it all together. According to Joseph Smith, the angel Morani brought golden plates to him that became the Book of Mormon. Yet, despite the claim to be divine revelation, the Book of Mormon does not contain one historically viable fact, nor does it contain any fulfilled prophecy. So, unlike the Quran or the Book of Mormon or the Rig Veda or any other books, uh, they were written by a single person without you know, a universal theme, and you have the Bible with 40 authors over 1,500 years, they are all recording God's message in a unified way, and they are very diverse people. David was a shepherd, Solomon was a monarch, Amos was a herdsman, Luke was a doctor, Paul was a rabbi, Peter was a fisherman, yet despite all of these authors in all of these settings, the Bible has a common theme. That mankind has fallen away from their creator, and the creator is doing everything imaginable to redeem a people for himself. Every other story talks about how people have to get to God. The Bible tells the story of how God gets to people. It's the only book that's alive and divine and showing us in unified fashion creation, fall, redemption, restoration. It's telling us a story of unity. And then lastly, maybe you've experienced this yourself, power. Whenever this book has been read, people have been morally and permanently changed. I love apologetics. I think it's beautiful. I've gone to debates. I read stuff. It's great. The first three points defend the Bible. But when they asked Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, to defend the Bible, he he told a story. He said, it's as if you got a bunch of uh, military guys to defend a lion. There's this lion in a cage, and you have these men defending the lion, and they just want more men to defend the lion. And Charles Spurgeon said, here's an idea. What if you just open the cage? That lion will defend itself. Trust me, open the cage. You won't need anybody to defend the lion. He said, in the same way, the word of God just needs to be opened. Just open the cage, and the gospel and the word will defend itself, because where this book goes, power goes. But the real power of the Bible, and maybe you and I haven't experienced this, but the real power of the Bible isn't intellectual. It's beautiful. There's intellect involved. But when you reason with the words and you engage the words, the real power comes when you take a step of faith and obey the words. We don't experience the power of the word without obedience to the word. You must obey the word. So sure, reason with it, but then respond to it. Reason with it, and then respond to it. Obey the word and experience its power. But again, biblical faith so often is seen as like you've got to take this step of faith and then hope that, you know, the ledge shows up. It's almost like Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. I know some of you are too young for that, but there's this movie 
Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, and he's, he's got this big bridge to cross, and nothing shows up until he takes a step, and then when he takes a step, the bridge appears, and it's this massive thing, and people throughout, throughout history have been like, that's what Christian faith is, church. That is not Christian faith. Christian faith does not take a blind step and hope it appears. It's not Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's better seen at a swimming pool where you have a little kid about to jump off the side and, and be caught by their father. This little kid is on the edge, and they're reasoning. They're like, that water's deep, that water's cold, these floaties aren't great, I can't swim. But that's my dad. He's generally trustworthy, he doesn't drop me that much, like, he's <laughs> dropped me once, but we've made up for it. He seems strong enough to carry me, and so, based on all of that reasoning, and based on the substance of the character and the strength of my father, and the historical record of my father, you didn't know five-year-olds are doing all this, but they're doing all this in their head, they're calculating, and then they jump and they are caught by their father. Their reason is, that's my dad and he doesn't drop me. He's, he's trustworthy. I'll jump to him because he catches me. When I step, I'll be met by his faithfulness. Biblical faith is not a blind leap. It's a leap of trust based on truth. If there's a tulip in the snow, if there's a father in the swimming pool, and we're going to make it. And the reason we do all of that lead up is to say we should be people like the Bereans who are eager to hear the word of God. That is, that is countercultural. If you were to describe 2024 America, you would not say eager for the word of God. That would not be the word you would use. Eager for the word. Every single day, engaging the word and looking at it and making it apply to them and then obeying it. If, if we want to be like them, it's hard. Because if you start trying to obey the Bible, it's hard. God's vision for sexuality is laughable in our culture. God's vision for sexual purity is laughable in our culture. God's vision for forgiveness is wild in our culture. You mean to tell me you would forgive someone after all they've done to you? The Bible tells us to love our enemies. The Bible tells us to pray for those who persecute you. It says to take care of the poor and the marginalized. The Bible tells us to provide a family for the widow and for the orphan. It tells you to take up your cross and die to yourself. Deny yourself. Put that on social media. Put that on Instagram. That doesn't sell, by the way. I don't know if you're following cultural Bible talk. It is not deny yourself. It's follow your heart, love yourself, serve yourself, you do you. That's not the design of the word. This is hard. The Bible tells you to be sacrificially generous. It goes on and on on the way to a flourishing, joyful, glorious life, and it is daily at odds with the ways of this world. So this is no easy task. So we must reason with the word. We must put our faith in the word, and then you experience the joy of Christ on the other side of obedience to the word. Often you experience the hope of Christ on the other side of obedience to the word. You experience the, the, the glorious peace that transcends all understanding on the other side of obedience to the word. So church, may this Berean vision start to be our vision. That we're eager. We love the word of God. We want it. Even though it's hard, we're, we're going to receive it. We're going to examine it every day. We're going to obey. If you were to talk about Grace Church, they, you would use the word obedient. Those people obey the word. They love the word. They're eager for the word. That is the kind of people that were found in Acts 17, and the word of God multiplied upon them. And it's, it's beautiful. So we hold the Bible, and we treasure it, and we say, in this book, we have the living, active goodness of God applied to me. In 2, Corinthians, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says the Bible is the breath of God. The scripture is God-breathed, living and active and correcting us and training us and helping us grow to be the, the people equipped that God's asked us to be. That's the design. So if, it's almost like Paul's saying, hey, church, do you want to breathe? Then read the word. Are you having trouble breathing? Come to the word. If you need breath in this generation that provides nothing that actually sustains your lungs, come to the word and breathe, reason with it, wrestle with it, trust it, and ultimately obey it. And then it gets even more beautiful that the image, or the, the instruction of the Bible is not to obey the Bible. The instruction of the Bible is to put your obedience in a person, to trust the living word. 
John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 goes on to say, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That in Christ we have the living Word of God that calls us to obey, and that is so beautiful. That Christ came and dwelt among us, lived the perfect life, died in our place, resurrected from the dead, and now calls for us to obey Him because He knows the best way to do everything. That's the invitation for us, church, and it's a beautiful invitation. And so this morning, we want to be people like the Bereans, that eagerly hear the word, respond to the word, and obey the word, knowing that the word is a person. His name is Jesus, and he knows the best way to do everything. And he proved that to us in the most loving way imaginable, by laying down his life in our place. And so we celebrate communion as a church. We're going to do that this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, the band's going to come out, and we're going to get a chance to celebrate the living word dying in our place so that we might have the treasure of the gospel transforming our hearts. So let's pray that we be that kind of people. Father, thank you for your word. Whether it sits in our house on a bookshelf, Whether we engage it every day, God, your word stands as an open invitation to be transformed by your power. God, I pray that we would receive the invitation and that every day we would examine your word eagerly seeking truth, eagerly seeking to reorient ourselves to your vision of the world. God, our vision of the world is broken, the world's vision of the world is broken. And your your Bible stands as an invitation for us to a future reality. God, may we receive it. And Lord, now as we prepare to celebrate communion, Father, would our hearts be submissive to the living word who died in our place to give us the good news. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.